Well, welcome to the last week of our great high priest. I'm so glad that you've decided to spend a little bit of your weekend with us. Happy Father's Day to all of you who are celebrating. Happy future Father's Day to those of you who are yet to celebrate. And to the moms, it's not your day. Um, so not a very happy Unfather's Day to you. Um, man, if you're the first time here, my name is Blake. I'm the senior pastor here at Gloucester County Community Church. Welcome to our church. Welcome to our family. I'd love to just say hi to you, meet you in the lobby, exchange your connection card for a gift. We just want to say thank you for coming here. Maybe have a hot dog with me out by one of the cool cars out there, take a picture, anything like that. I'd just love to meet you and thank you for being here, as well as exchange your card for prayer this week. We believe you came in here looking for something, and we believe that we can show you what you're looking for, whether that's a new relationship with some type of spirituality. We're going to learn about that in a little bit, or whether you're just looking for a new home church, a new community. We're excited that you're here and love to connect with you. One of the things that you need to know, and this is something we've continually reminded, is we're a place of honor, and we want to be able to honor you in the best way possible. And one of the ways that I intend to honor you is by pastoring you to the best of my ability. But I need Need your help to pastor you. And if you can help me help you by letting us know that you are here. Um, you can do that in a few different ways. You can text the number here um, on the back of your connection card. Just text that number, type the word here, and then click the link. You can download our app, and there's a button right in our app that says, I'm here. Press that button. That'll let us know you're here. Or by filling out your connection card and placing it in the offering basket on the way out. And you may say, Pastor Blake, why are you doing that? It's truly because this. I've been your pastor for eight months, and I don't know all of you, and I want to pastor you the best of my ability. And so I want you to let me know you're here so that, number one, I can be praying for you. If you hand in your connection card every week, it can guarantee that somebody on our staff is going to be praying for you this week. Number two, I want to be caring for you. My heart would break if somebody comes here to our church and is disconnected simply because we didn't know they were here. You know, most of the time people leave churches because they don't feel connected. So whether you've been here all 40 years or whether you've been here for like 40 minutes, I want to know that you're here so that I can best pastor you. What that looks like is if you miss a week, you're going to get a postcard, a letter, a phone call, a text message, something to just to let you know church wasn't the same without you in it. Um, we believe that here, and we want to be able to best take care of our family, and that's the best way I know how. So if you would help me help you, that would be a huge help. Speaking of honor, we're not only honoring dads, grandpas, and all those things, great-grandparents. We have two holidays to honor today. Um, today is Father's Day, but tomorrow is Juneteenth, a recent federal holiday. And I hope you take part of your holiday, both today and tomorrow, to honor the freedom that was granted. For those of you who are a little newer to Juneteenth, let me inform you. It's a federal holiday commemorating the emancipation of our enslaved brothers and sisters. Deriving its name from combining June and 19th, it's celebrated on the anniversary of the order issued by General Gordon Granger on June 19th. 1865. This is a fundamental freedom given to us by God, but granted to our brothers and sisters of color much later. And we have an opportunity to honor that. And at Gloucester County Community Church, I just wanted to take a moment and honor that freedom granted to us by God, given to our brothers and sisters much later than some of us received. So church, why don't we pray, and then we're going to get into the message. Father, you are good, and we thank you for our goodness. We thank you for all that you've done and all that you will do. Lord, as we honor fathers this morning, grandfathers this morning, great-grandfathers this morning, future fathers this morning, we thank you for you being truly the good, good father. But Lord, we also take a moment to honor the freedom that you've granted us. Lord, let us learn from our history of not giving that freedom that you've granted freely to others. Allow us to reflect and commemorate both today and tomorrow as we celebrate the great freedoms that you've given us, first and foremost, by worshiping you and honoring your son. We love you. Thank you for loving us. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Man, it's tough to be a dad. I'll tell you what. Um, there have been moments in my fatherhood journey 
that have been really funny. One of my favorite moments with my son is truly, I was calling him to do something. I said, Liam, come here. And he just, he stood there, frozen. I said, Liam, come here. Can you hear me? Yeah, dad, I can hear you. Why aren't you coming? Oh, one of the ghosts has my legs. Dead serious, just deadpanned. And I said, well, you let the ghosts know that they're going to be in trouble if they don't come to daddy. And magically, the ghosts disappeared. It was incredible. One of my favorite moments with my daughter is truly, we were just walking one day on a daddy-daughter date. And this is Eva. We're just walking along. She's four, by the way. We're walking along, and she just goes, <sighs> and I go, what's on your mind, E? She goes, I just want to be in charge. <laughs> She's four. She's four years old. Humorous moments being a dad, those are awesome. But then there's been times, too, that being dad's tough. Like when you're having that conversation with your spouse and your two kids come up and say, you know, dad, um, the Bible says to be kind. That's tough. Today, we're going to finish our series, The Great High Priest, our great high priest, about talking about the high priest's greatest office, the father. He's the father. And we're going to take a break from Hebrews, and we're going to tell one of the most amazing stories in all of Scripture, but a super popular story. You may know it as the prodigal son, but I don't think that does it justice. I like to call it the story of the two lost sons, and you'll see why. Let me set up the background a little bit for you. We're in, in Luke chapter 15 today, and in Luke chapter 15, it starts, the first two verses, tell us who Luke or who Jesus is talking to. You see, let me help you understand the background. Jesus was attracting a lot of tax collectors and sinners, and it's really interesting. We've talked about this before, how they separate the two, basically the sinners and then like the really, really, really bad sinners, the tax collectors, and Jesus was attracting a lot of these people, and even, even, even eating dinner with them, which really was a major offense to another group of people who Jesus was attracting, but they were pretty frustrated with him, called the Pharisees. The religious people were looking on the outside, most likely with jealousy, standing back and saying, these people don't go to our church. Clearly, this guy, Jesus, isn't really teaching the truth. That's never been said before. And so they go and they continue to, to, to get angry with Jesus because he's attracting all these people. He's eating with these people, which basically means, shocker, he accepts these people. And this is a major cultural thing. And now all of these Pharisees are gathered around Jesus and they're asking him all of these questions. They're claiming he eats with these people. And Jesus starts into a series of three stories because he's an amazing storyteller. He tells the story of the lost coin. He tells the story of the lost sheep and he tells the story of the two lost sons really interesting the story of the lost coin story of the lost sheep all start and end the same way there was something lost and then the owner of that lost thing goes and finds it and then there was something lost there was a sheep and the owner of the sheep the shepherd goes and finds it so naturally the stories are compiling and then they go to the story of the two lost sons and the father doesn't go and find it. Huh. Really interesting. So today we're going to see what we can learn in a message that I've entitled Prodigal God. You see, we have to understand the term prodigal a little bit. It's defined as having or giving something on a lavish scale. I wish this was original to me, but it's not. There's actually a great book called The Prodigal God by Timothy Keller, and I'm going to share some of the quotes from that in and throughout my whole message today. But I wanted to give you a concept, an idea, so we can redefine prodigal in our mind and really see who the prodigal is in the story of the two lost sons. Let's read the passage together, Luke 15, chap, uh, Luke 15 verses 11 through 32. And he said, there it is. There was a man who had two sons, not one. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me a share of the property that is coming to me. 
Let's stop there. I'm just gonna tell you a story today and see how it influences God, informs us of God. Father, give me my property. Now, in this culture, this would not have been a weird response or a a weird request. You see, in this culture, if you had two sons, the first son got double blessing. So this man had two sons, and I'm not great at math, but I'm pretty good. So that means you would divide it into two thirds, the younger son getting one third, the older son getting two thirds. So basically, what the son is saying is, dad, give me a third of everything that's yours. Give me a third. Give me the third that's owed me. That's owed me. That's not a crazy request. The crazy request is he's making this request before his dad dies. Major dishonor. Major disrespect. Major overstep. And in that time, all wealth was gained by mostly property and possession. It wasn't like he had a bank and a business that was funding uh, funding the bank account. He had property and possession. So what he was saying to his father is, I want you to cut off all of your ability to gain wealth on my property and sell it all off and give it all to me. I know you'll never be able to make money that way again. Major disrespect. And in in, in old ancient Hebrew culture or Middle Eastern culture, the father had every right to literally drive the son out physically for his request. Like you can picture him literally walking his son off the property and disowning him because of this request. And remember, Jesus is telling this story now. This is the father's response. Father, give me a share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between him. He just does it. This would have floored ancient readers. Totally prodigal. Wild behavior. Different, unique than any other father's response. Then what happens? Not many days later, the son gathered all he had because it took the father a few days to sell off, you know, a third of all of his possessions. And he took a journey into the far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine rose in that country and he began to be in need. So the son takes everything the father had his one third, spends it all, goes and buys the high rise in New York, ends up in the streets of Manhattan, right? Like this is, this is what happens. He goes to all the dive bars. He, he drains everything that he has. And now he's just left and realizes he's in need. It's really interesting too, that a famine arose in the country. Not only is all of his wealth gone, but the possessions that he normally would have had are now liquefied and he can't regain those possessions because it's in a famine. It's saying he's in zero position of gain. It's all gone. All gone. Which the father knew, of course. He continues. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pig ate, and no one gave him anything. Couldn't even get a meal. Wasn't even a good beggar. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have had more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? You know, it's really interesting, okay? As we work through this passage, he said, how many of my father's hired servants? You see, there was was almost a ladder in society of what would take place. He didn't say how many of my father's servants. He said how many of my father's hired 
servants. This is really, really important. Here's the reason why. You see, in this culture, if you were part of the family, you lived in the main house. But because all wealth was gained by possession and things and property, you, if you were one of the servants, you also lived on the property and were fed and were taken care of. That was like the second level of community. And then there was a third level that was hired servants. Hired servants didn't have access to the communal living. They couldn't live on the property. They were brought in from different cities. They were hired to do a job, and then they would leave back to those cities. He looked and said, even the people who are outside of my dad's community live better than me. He wasn't even saying the community. He was saying just our hired hand, not even the people we invite to the table. They live better than me. It's incredible. The story goes on, and the son begins to rehearse his apology in his head. You ever realize how bad you've messed up that you begin rehearsing what you're going to say to that person? You're nervous, you're scared, you're thinking how they could respond. Maybe it wasn't that for you, like with, with an apology, but maybe for you, you get a little nervous, like asking for a raise or something like that, and you start rehearsing in your mind. All right, this is why I know I'm good at my job. I know I deserve this. I know I deserve that. And you just start rehearsing it over and over and over and over and over again in your head. The son gets a rehearsed speech. You see this? He says, I will arise and go to my father, and this is what I'll say to him. And he writes down his speech. Think about this, okay? There's this younger son, and he's lost everything, and he's cut his dad's ability off to gain wealth in a third of what his dad previously owned. And he thinks to himself, while he's in the middle of the pigsty, while he's laid out, starving, probably with a stick, literally finding on a rock, and just dipping it in the mud and writing out, okay, Father, I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Yeah, that sounds good. Father, I've sinned against you. I don't belong in the community. Yeah, that's true. Man, I can't believe I left. What was I thinking? None of this is worth it. He, he continues to rehearse. Treat me as one of your hired servants. Yeah, maybe he'll bring me back. Not into the full community, but if, if I could just see it again. If, if I could just get a glimpse of that community again. I don't need to live there. I know I don't deserve that. But will you bring me back as a servant? You can picture it, right? He, he takes the rock and he puts it in his pocket. He starts walking down the road and periodically he pulls it out and just begins to rehearse again. Father, I'm so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. Please just let me work for you. Maybe I can earn back some of what you sold. Maybe I can earn back some of and he's rehearsing, and he's walking, and he's taking the journey, and he's stepping. He's going forward continually, and, the, and you can see, and you can picture Jesus telling the story. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Picture the scene, right? The dad standing there with this initiating love every day, day after day after day after day waiting for his son to return, not like the shepherd that went out and sought the sheep, not like the lady who went out and found the coin, but a good father sitting there waiting for his son to return. He didn't shield him from the brokenness 
but he was always there with the initiating love. The moment he saw him take the first step and you can see the son not really seeing his dad as he's just looking down at the tablet, rehearsing his speech. And then all of a sudden he begins to see something in the distance and it's running towards him and it's running faster. And he thinks, surely that's not my dad running because patriarchs in the Middle East, they don't run. (laughs) That was reserved for boys and that was reserved for young men, old men, Patriarchs in the Middle East did not run. It was undignified. And this man in his robe is now showing his legs because he has to lift it up. This is undignified. This is reckless. This is prodigal. And the father runs after him. Showing this great, reckless, prodigal, carefree, Amazing love, taking on the humiliation, the shame that the son once gave. And he runs up to him and he hugs him and he kisses him. And then the son tries to go into his rehearsed speech. And he, (laughs) it's great. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son. He's dead and he's alive again. He's lost and he's found. And they began to celebrate. You picture the story. The son is babbling over his words saying, Dad, I know I don't, I don't believe your son. And he's just like, guys, get, hire the DJ. Bring in the caterer. Invite the whole village. Grab my ring. Put the best suit on. Bring in the tailor. It's going to need to be brought up. Get us all the good wine. Bring everything there. And he's saying, Dad, I, I know I'm not. And he, I can't hear you, son. I'm, I'm too busy throwing the party. I'm too busy arranging things. I'm too busy getting things going. But dad, I'm not worried. Bring everything. In that culture, they didn't have meat with every meal. This is like a a once-in-a-lifetime party. The fattened calf is the most expensive piece of meat during this time. Literally, in our culture, it's like, bring in the Wagyu beef, get him the Rolex, bring out the Rolls Royce, let him roll around, like, everything you need. Throw the party. Hire the DJ. The best caterer. Only the best. Because my son was lost, and now he's found. And, and, and let's celebrate. Let's celebrate. It's amazing. The younger brother, seeking self-discovery. What does the younger brother teach us? The younger brother demonstrates, according to Tim Keller, the younger brother then demonstrates the lavish prodigality of God's grace. Jesus shows the father pouncing on his son in love, not only before he has a chance to clean up his life and evidence of a changed heart, but even before he can recite his rehearsed speech. He doesn't even get to the point to where he's like, "Uh, bring me back as a hired guy. He can't even get there. You see, nothing merits the favor of God. The Father's love and acceptance are absolutely free. Free. Initiated towards you. Waiting for you to receive it. The younger brother. What he said to his father when he left is, Dad, I don't want you. I want you what you can provide for me. You know how the father answers that? All I want is you, son. I love you, son. I'm here, son. Lavish, prodigal. Relentless love. But this is the story of the two lost sons. 
And it continues. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother's come and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. <clears throat> Why was the brother angry? You know, in different years, we've, we've now discussed both sons. I get that. But I wonder if we really understand why the brother was angry. He wasn't just a boring dude who didn't like parties. Like, when the servant said, the father has accepted him again. What that means is all of the inheritance was just redrawn again. That now the two thirds that was left for the older brother now is divided again. And one third is going back to the younger brother. The older brothers wanted the same thing. One sought in a reckless lifestyle, one sought to receive what he wanted in obedience. But here's the key, through pride. Two lost sons, one younger, one older. How does the story continue? It goes like this. We see this. His father came out and entreated him. Remember this. But he answered his father, and he looks at his dad and says, Look, these many years I've served you, and I've never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when your son comes, the one who's devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him. You ever been there, church? You ever see a miraculous story of God's grace in a new believer, the younger brother? And if you're honest with yourself in the darkest moments, in the depths of your heart, you look and say, God, I've served you for 20 years and never have I got a blessing like that. I live my life. I serve every Sunday. I'm faithful to my church. I give, I serve, I, I continue to work and I work and I work and I work for you. And I've never received something like that. Where's my fattened calf? I see all of this blessing in their life. Where's mine? Where's mine? The older brother. Prideful. Desiring the same thing that the younger brother desires, which is what the father can give rather than the relationship with the father. One tries to gain it with recklessness, one tries to gain it with prideful obedience. But there's another character in the story. It's the father. It's so interesting how he stays the same. Look at the father's response then to the older brother. He said to him, son. Now he was just disrespected by his son. most likely in front of servants. He then too could have cast this brother away. But instead he responds to him with son. Son, you're always with me and all that mine is mine is yours. That's true now. He sold everything else. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He's lost and is found. How does the father respond to his older son's rebellion? He says, my son, despite how you've insulted me publicly, I still want you at the feast. 
I'm not going to disown your brother, and I'm not going to disown you either. I challenge you to swallow your pride and come into the feast. The choice is yours. Will you or will you not? It's an unexpected, gracious, dramatic appeal to the second lost son. And here you can see the Pharisees, the tax collectors, the sinners on the edge of their seat. Will the family finally be reunited in unity and love? Will the brothers be reconciled? Will the elder brother be softened by this remarkable offer and be reconciled to the father? Just as all of these thoughts begin to pass our mind, the story ends. Why doesn't Jesus finish the story? (sighs) Because the story isn't about the brothers. The story's about the father. We can almost hear the Pharisees gasp at the end of the story. It was a complete reversal of everything they'd ever been taught. Jesus does not only simply leave it at that. It gets more shocking. Why doesn't the elder brother go in? He gives the reason. Because I've never disobeyed you. The elder brother is not losing the father's love in spite of his goodness, but because of it. It's not his sins that create the barrier between him and his father. It's the pride he has in his moral record. It's not the wrongdoing, but his righteousness that is keeping him from sharing in the feast of the father. How could this be? The answer is that the brother's hearts and the two ways of life they represent are much more alike than they first appear. What did the younger son want most in life? He wanted to make his own decisions and have unfettering control of his portion of the wealth. How did he get that? By a bold power play. Declaration of independence. What did the older son most want? The same thing. He was just as resentful of the father as was the younger son. He too wanted the father's goods rather than the father himself. However, while the younger brother went far away, The elder brother stayed close and never disobeyed. This was his way to get control. His unspoken demand is, I've never disobeyed you. Now you have to do things in my life the way I want them done. The hearts of the brothers were the same. Both sons resented their father's authority and sought ways to get out from under it. They each wanted to get into a position in which they could tell the father what to do. Each one rebelled, but one did so by being very bad, and the other did so by being very good. Both were alienated from the Father's heart. Both lost sons. You realize then what Jesus is teaching? Can you see it? Neither son loved the Father for himself. They both were using the father for their own self-centered ends rather than loving, enjoying, and serving him for his own sake. This means that you can rebel against God and be alienated from him by either breaking his rules or by keeping all of them pridefully. It's a shocking message. Careful obedience with the wrong motive to God's law serves also as a strategy for rebelling against God. So what does this teach us about the Father? On Father's Day, it's that God's love is an initiating love. Notice how the Father comes out to both sons and expresses love to both of them in order to bring both back in. It says, here comes this son of mine. And he looks at the other older son and says, son, I want you to be part. This picture, it shows that even the most religious and moral people need the initiating grace of God. And the most far away, immoral people need the initiating grace grace of God. So the question's this. Took a long time to get to one point. (laughs) Will you receive the initiating love of God? Or do you need to be reminded that his initiating love is still there? 
You see, I believe all of us fall into two camps. One, we need to receive this initiating Father's love. I'm gonna tell you how to do so in a moment. But I think the majority of us are in the second camp that need to be reminded of the initiating love of the Father. Maybe you've been sitting as the older brother for far too long. Is the resent in your heart? Is the frustration with God over the blessing he's given to someone and not to you? Man, can I, can I be honest with you? I, I've been both the younger brother and the older brother. I've been morally righteous in my standing saying, God, I've done so much. Why would you do this? <laughs> And I've also been the younger brother that stands there and says, so God, I, 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 um, I just, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what I'm doing. And, and my bet is that you've been both as well. And maybe your heart's leaning towards one or the other right now. Maybe your heart is, is moving towards one or the other now. And you need to either receive the initiating love of God for the first time in your life or run back to the initiated love of God. Man, if you need to receive it for the first time, you need to mirror what the younger son did. Acknowledge that you're not perfect. Nobody is. Don't let it take you to being in a pigsty to do it. Believe that there's a place for you. The younger son did. That place is far greater than you can ever imagine. And that place is only granted to you by the death, burial, and resurrection of a person that we know as Jesus. He loved you so much that he saw you when you were the younger son. He left heaven, came down and lived a perfect life and died a perfect death raising three days later to save sinners just like you and just like me. And then do what the younger son did, just, just call out to him in a simple prayer that I'm gonna lead you in right now. So with all heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around, something like this will do. God, I know I'm not perfect. I've sinned. I changed my mind about my path and I believe in your path. I believe that your son Jesus died on the cross for my sins and rose again three days later. And I'm asking him to be my savior. Help me to live for him. I love you. Thank you for bringing me home. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, if you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to, to let me know. I want to help you. You just made the greatest decision you've ever made in your life. And I want to help you by getting you started on this pathway. You can let me know by filling out your connection card, marking that you've decided to receive Jesus, or simply by emailing me at blake at gcccpray.com. And wherever you find yourself today, we're so thrilled that you've started this journey but for those of you who need to be reminded, reminded of the initiating love of God, for us who we call saved, live in the amazing freedom of the initiating love that he provided. Do good works, but not because you're scared of the consequences of not doing them, just because you enjoy the Father. 